Hi, I'm Ken Howard, and welcome to the Gay Therapy LA podcast. Today, I would like to talk to you about gay men's relationships, reconciling the living room with the bedroom sexually. So, we want to look at the contrast that I see a lot in my practice. You know, you know me. <laughs> um, I've been a gay men's specialist therapist working almost exclusively with gay men as a therapist and life and relationship and career coach for 27 years now. That's a lot of couples and, and it's a lot of guys in relationships. And I like to talk about the themes that I've seen over the years. I always joke, the older I get, the stronger my opinions get, just because I keep seeing the same problems over and over again that gay men have. And the nice thing is I also see the same solutions that work over and over again. So I have a lot of confidence that some of the things I work with guys on and help them out with are likely, we can't say guaranteed, because you can't guarantee things about human behavior, and circumstance, but they're likely to help you out. Especially with gay couples. Gay couples tend to have the same problems over and over again, which uh, would be boring if I didn't like it so much, but I like helping gay couples, even though the problems are remarkably similar from couple to couple, and oftentimes their solutions to their problems are awfully similar too, or at least they're thematic. So one of those themes that gay couples sometimes struggle with is what I call reconciling the living room with the bedroom. Now, I'm borrowing liberally from my colleague. There's a, a colleague uh, named Esther Perel, P-E-R-E-L. She's written a couple of great books. Mating in Captivity is one of them, and it's about relationship dynamics, including gay relationships, but primarily focused on straight ones. She's also written another book called The State of Affairs, about how a couple gets past, survives an affair. It's a clever title. But uh, Esther Perel's work uh, with her books, her seminars, and I think a podcast too, um, I think it's called Where Should We Begin, I think. Um, but I like her work because it's very compelling and it's not really like some of the other uh straight focused therapist, um, couples therapists, who have a lot of material out there that I think gets into a lot of sexism and certainly heterosexism and it starts to have limited application to gay men, to open relationships, to polyamorous relationships. I don't find it progressive. Um, and I teach a couples therapy course, uh, a semester course for graduate uh, MSW, Master of Social Work students at USC, the University of Southern California, and we look at the different models of couples therapy, so I'm drawing on some of that as well. But the dilemma, this idea of reconciling the living room with the bedroom, is what I call it when gay male couples struggle to reconcile how their relationships are kind of non-sexually in other rooms of their house, and then what goes on in the bedroom. You know, we have to reconcile, as Esther Perel says, the erotic with the domestic. So let's talk for a minute about what I call the living room tasks of a gay male couple. And this would apply to straight couples too, but let's just focus on the guys for now. So a living room task for a couple might be the idea of sharing chores. I've worked in couples therapy with guys who have trouble finding out what's fair. You know, what is a fair dividing of the household chores between one partner, the other partner, and then maybe others that might be involved, like having a cleaning person or having a gardener or something like that. It depends on your socioeconomic status about whether or not you might have some kind of household or yard help. I work with a lot of guys in LA, a lot of guys who are really well off. Um, some of them have an entire household staff where they have a maid and a gardener and a childcare person and uh, assistance or something like that. Others might not even be able to afford even a low-cost cleaning person and they have to share all the domestic chores themselves. But the partners have to somehow come to an agreement about what is fair in sharing household chores. Who does the household repairs? You know, it's the old joke with two gay men, there's no lesbians around with power tools, so how are you going to get things fixed, right? <laughs> so I'm teasing about the lesbian stereotype. Anyway, Household repairs would be something. Pet care. You know, if you have a cat, who cleans the litter box? If you have a dog, who walks the dog? 
those are all living room ideas managing your social calendar with each other's families of origin or even your peers gay men especially in urban centers tend to be very social creatures and so uh some guys have talked to me about a little bit of a stress managing their social calendar with you know summer pool parties or holiday parties in the winter or pride events around pride you know we're just social all year round in terms of the gay male community a living room idea might be how do you take care of your relationship with a sense of romance or intimacy are you celebrating your birthdays or your anniversary valentine's day or do you have a weekly date night you know just to keep the romantic fires burning over the very long term what kind of social interaction do you have with your partner are there pet names are there jokes uh, you know sometimes when you treat your partner sure like your lover but also kinda like your best friend a living room idea might be income differences on gaytherapyla.com I have a blog article about when you and your partners incomes differ greatly that's something that I've seen a lot in couples therapy and there's different approaches to that you know gay men can be in professions of all kinds and uh, so you know along with different fields and different educations and different aptitudes is going to come different salaries that come with the job that you do it, it, whether you're salaried or whether you're freelance is is a big one in LA somebody who has a corporate job might be partnered to somebody who has a freelance artistic job like doing hair or makeup or being an actor or being a model or being a designer who goes from gig to gig a living room issue might be the cultural differences I have a blog article on gay therapy like also about uh, when you and your partner come from different cultural backgrounds in LA I see just all kinds of mixes Anglo and Asian Asian and African American uh, Latin and Middle Eastern it's just it's LA it's very diverse and other urban centers are too and it's worth just some discussion about what are the cultural differences that are affecting each of you and how you were raised in your family of origin and then how that impacts your relationships individual family of origin differences you know sometimes it's not a whole big cultural difference but sometimes it's about a difference just in the personality of your individual family of origin that you come from uh, a chaotic family a very orderly family a very hierarchical family uh, a very progressive or non-traditional family um, things like schedule differences this comes up a lot with gay male professionals where there might be a lot of work travel or one partner has a lot of business travel and the other one does not where the time together is extra special because it may be the only time that you're together in the course of the week you know I work with guys who only spend two or three nights of the week together and the rest of the time they're consultants in other cities or they're uh, they're doing some kind of work travel just part of their everyday work life there may be academic and professional differences one of you is doctoral level or master's level and the other one has a GED or d didn't finish high school or there may be all different kinds of levels of academic background and achievement and maybe different professional identities when you're together you're off the clock you're just being people you're just being guys but in a professional setting you may be you know counsel for the defense you might be a judge you might be a director you might be a writer um, there's a professional identity that you kind of put on once you leave your front door that your partner may not see very much of and like I said the role of each other's respective families you know one partner might have a family that's local and you see them a lot and the other partner might have a family that's far away and you really have to work you really have to fly for five or six hours or so or more to see their family of origin so these are kind of these living room ideas now let's kind of switch that and talk about the bedroom ideas so in the bedroom of course the big one I think is sexual identity sexual role identity top bottom versatile and this comes up a lot just as a sex therapist which I also do I mean I'll do couples therapy which is about 
the emotional and the relational dynamics. And then sometimes it is about being a sex therapist, about troubleshooting specifically sexual issues in the relationship, differences in libido or desire, sexual dysfunction of some kind, like erectile dysfunction or some kind of pain, um, the role of trauma, uh, if one partner has been the survivor of sexual assault or the survivor of incest or sexual abuse, that can certainly affect an adult sex life uh, in all relationships, including gay male ones. But, uh, you know, sometimes there's a sexual sex therapy issue in terms of troubleshooting. How do you get along in terms of sexual compatibility? You know, what if you're two tops in a relationship or what if you're two bottoms in a relationship? It doesn't mean that you can't be together. It means that there has to be some kind of an adult discussion about, okay, what's the workaround for that? So that both partners are reasonably sexually satisfied, getting what they want in terms of what their body wants to do. You know, we have to listen to what our bodies as men want to do in terms of sexual pleasure, because if we ignored and denied who we are sexually and what we want, well, you know, screw it. We could all, you know, act heterosexual and get all kinds of heterosexual privilege, but that's not who we are. You know, part of coming out, announcing to ourselves and to the world about being gay and not straight is validating what we want sexually. You know, sometimes in politics now, there's this thing about, oh, well, you can be gay, but you just can't have sex. Well, or you can have sex, but you can't enjoy it. Or, you know, something like that. You know, kind of the anti-pleasure crowd. And this sometimes gets discussed in the condom controversy or the prep thing or being a Travada whore or, you know, some of these things about stigma, which I, by the way, I, I think that's actually left over from, you know, misogynistic sexism, calling a woman a slut or that a, a woman is only a value in society if she's a virgin at marriage. You know, some cultures of the world, um, Asian, Muslim, or even in the United States, you know, kind of judge women by how sexually pure they are. And sometimes that gets carried over into the gay community. We'll, we'll have another episode maybe about that. That, that comes into play a lot in topics about so-called porn addiction or uh, the one I really can't stand, sex addiction, which is the biggest charlatanism that's been proposed in mental health for many years. But um, that's for another time. But uh, a, a dilemma or a discussion that's a bedroom issue might be about sexual roles. Very similarly, a bedroom discussion might be about vanilla versus kink. You know, I work a lot with guys who are into kink in different forms, leather, rubber, BDSM, uniforms, bondage, um, polyamory, or various, a million different forms of open relationships. But sometimes that is a topic to be discussed and kind of negotiated between the partners about what if not only top, bottom, versatile preferences, but vanilla versus kink play there's some differences there and then how do you navigate that how do you kind of affirm that that is sometimes the role of an open relationship where a partner might be vanilla with his primary partner or spouse but might be kinky with outside partners i've worked with couples on that exact situation a number of times now another bedroom idea or dilemma might be uh what are your solo sex lives like you know what is the role of masturbation for you as an individual what is your relationship to porn we hear all this crap now about you know anti-masturbation month or um you know or porn addiction and all this kind of shrill alarmist stuff and you know, a great book on this is by David Lay, L-E-Y, a fantastic sexologist and psychologist called Ethical Porn for Dicks. And in that book, he talks about, you know, how porn could be a healthy thing for either gay or straight couples. And it's not this, you know, stigmatized bugaboo. Some politician said porn was a public health crisis. You know, I think trying to piggyback on the hysteria about the AIDS crisis. And you know, very few things are a public health crisis except for public health crises, um, you know, like the reemergence of, of measles from the anti-vax movement. That's a problem. But, um, you know, porn and masturbation is, uh, 
not a problem. It, it, people who say it is are kind of left over from that that Catholic thing, uh, or or very very sex negative corners of society. Also, a dilemma in the bedroom might be relationship sexually with your partner versus others. Do you do three ways? Do you do four ways? Are you involved in any kind of orgy or group sex scene? Where are the boundaries between you and your partner about what you do and do not do about that? Um, there might be some discussion about the role of substances um, You know, in your bedroom. There's you, there's your partner, there might be others, but are there also other things? Are there tools like uh, a fuck bench, or are there tools like bondage equipment, or would there be other things in there like substances? Do you have a bong or a vape pen, the role of marijuana? Are there other substances? And bringing a lot of critical thinking to saying how do substances help? and how do substances hurt. We always want to explore what's good about that situation, the role of ecstasy or molly, the role of GHB, which I hear a lot about these days, uh, maybe the role of cocaine, maybe the role of meth. You know, meth is absolutely the most troublesome in terms of sex-related substances that I hear about and that I help guys on. I've helped a lot of gay men in uh, recovery from meth because even relative to other kinds of recreational drugs it's particularly toxic even on a cellular level so uh, I had a recent podcast episode about gay men in recovery from meth and even prevention of meth use uh, because that's a hot topic among physicians and therapists who are kind of woke to gay men who are LGBT affirmative and, and more specifically gay male affirmative, um, we don't really like meth, even if we may be kind of progressive on other issues like other recreational drugs. I have this thing that I tell clients that I'm a liberal therapist on you know sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I, I know there are therapists and doctors that kind of adopt the federal government stance. I call it the alls. All drugs are all bad all the time for all people in all circumstances. I don't go that far, even though I know NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, and the federal party line is that because of legalities and taxation and politics and you know all kinds of stuff completely unrelated to public health, I might add. But um, you know, we want to bring a lot of critical thinking to the role of substances. You know, if if yes how is that done somehow safely in a way that enhances and if no okay no you know then you're ju you're stimulating each other and enjoying each other in ways that are completely unenhanced in a chemical way but something like that can easily be a topic between gay male partners in the bedroom another bedroom issue might be working around sexual trauma like i mentioned earlier if a partner's been raped you know, I've worked with probably five gay male rape survivors or victims, depending on what you want to call it. There's different value in calling it survivor versus calling it victim. That's maybe another episode right there. But, um, you know, your, your sexual life as a rape or sexual assault survivor or your adult sex life as an incest or molestation or other kinds of sexual abuse survivor... Um, it's very easy for your sexual relationship with a partner to be affected by that. Um, and I also have material on, uh, I, I think, another episode and certainly blog articles on GayTherapyLA.com about gay male survivors of incest and sexual abuse. You know, what about uh, in the bedroom a discussion around preferences about fetishes? You know the old, you know the saying, "Don't yuck my yum." <laughs> you know, for uh, a fetish that might be icky to one partner, might be really yummy to another partner, and sometimes you have to have a discussion about that, about how you might be able to get a fetish satisfied because it's really fun for you. Do you ask your partner to be involved in that, or maybe do you involve other partners in that? Um, is that satisfied through outside partners, and you kind of outsource a fetish or a special kink interest? Um, what is the role of fantasies? I attended a, a weekend seminar by a great guy, Justin Laymiller, L-E-H-M-I-L-L-E-R. 
Uh, Dr. Leigh Miller is uh, a sexologist and researcher, and he researched 4,000 Americans, you know, cisgender men and women, trans femme, trans masculine, um, bisexual people, LGBT, uh, a, a nice, you know, diverse cohort of people to study. And he studied their sexual fantasies, and it was some of the most important specific work, research, on sexual fantasies that had been done in a long time. And it culminated in a book called Tell Me What You Want. And that's a great book if you want to learn about, you know, how Americans really think about their sexual fantasies. And some of the many great takeaways were that he talked about in a seminar um, as, as part of uh, my sex therapist uh, training, preparing for certification, is that couples who talk about their sexual fantasies generally have a higher level of reported satisfaction in the relationship. And couples who act on their fantasies, not just talking about them, uh, even more so. So, you know, fantasies and sharing can really build intimacy. And I always say with a couple, shared experience builds intimacy. And that could be bad or good. You know, you could be stuck in an elevator for six hours with your partner and many years later say, wow, remember that time we were stuck in the elevator for six hours and we fucked for four and a half hours of it and then we kind of wanted more time when we were finally rescued by the fire department and we were kind of naked and they were kind of like, gosh, guys, what's going on? But, <laughs> you know, or it's something, it could be something bad, like the death of a loved one that you share and your partner helps you get through it. Or it could be something good, you know, like a job promotion or some kind of opportunity or, you know, some kind of uh, great act of fortune. But shared experience, especially over time, builds intimacy. And sharing fantasies over time can build intimacy. So some of this is about holding these private discussions and, you know, describing or talking about your fantasies and acting on them with each other or acting on them with others. But, you know, lately I've been working with just some ideas. Um, you know, one idea is some gay couples stop having sex with each other after a certain period of time. And that might be the time that they open the relationship. It might be the time when they have ambivalence about continuing in their relationship. I get a lot of guys asking, you know, in couples, what does it mean if we're not having sex as often as we used to, or if it's not as good as it used to be? Or even more and more often, what happens if we're not having sex with each other at all? You know, what does that mean? And, you know, for some couples, some guys would say, screw it, break up, that's the end. I don't think it's quite that bleak. I think that um, it's just an opportunity for discussion. It might bring you into couples therapy. You might talk about why sex is either less good or less frequent or even non-existent. Could it be about life stressors about your job? Could there be something going on about aging or health? Could there be an undiscussed conflict? I have this joke, you know, you can't lie to your dick. You know, if you're not aroused by your partner, it could be because you were even unconsciously angry about him and you have to have a discussion about what your beef is and kind of work through it in order to get to the other side. You know, I've worked with some couples that aren't having sex and then we talk about other things like how there's resentment about one partner has a corporate job and the other person has some, you know, a freelance working identity like being an actor but he hasn't had an acting class or an audition or booked a gig in you know a year and a half something like that and you know we work on those resentments and we work on expectations and we work on negotiations and then magically without even discussing the bedroom all of a sudden their sex life gets better because the unconscious res resentments or even the conscious resentments are addressed and it, when that barrier is removed that allows for the sexual life between them to flourish again other times there might be a medical discussion, like uh, the level of testosterone, the role that an endocrinologist doctor or a urologist might weigh in on. There may be some kind of injury. There could be issues around the side effects of a drug, like a blood pressure medication, an antidepressant medication, uh, some HIV meds, um, just different situations where 
something goes on medically and then it becomes a system. You know, a psychotherapist with the partner's permission might collaborate with a physician who's treating one or both partners, uh, especially if it's a specific sexual dysfunction, like erectile dysfunction, something like that. And there's different ways of, of dealing with that. You know, there's psychological ways of treating erectile dysfunction for a psychological etiology, and then there's medical interventions. You know, everything from, of course, you know, Viagra is the, the most well-known, or, or its cousins, you know, Levitra and Cialis, or it could be uh, some of the injectable medications called Trimix or Quadmix. Um, I've referred a lot of guys to Defy Medical, D-E-F-Y Medical.com, uh, the work of Dr. Justin Saya, and he's helped a lot of guys with things like uh, hormonal assessment, balancing your testosterone with your estrogen, with your prolactin, and just you know chemicals that might involve sex drive and sexual performance. But we really only want to look at the medical situation kind of in conjunction with any kind of psychological situation that might be going on, like emotional conflict between the partners. So, you know, there's, think of the bridge between the living room and the bedroom, you know, take a little exercise for a moment, think of your own life, think of your own relationship if you're in one, or think of your life, you know, in relation to partners, even if you're just dating, um, about how do you feel about kind of living room issues with the guys that you date and the guys that you're involved with, like we said earlier, chores, uh, a social calendar, date nights, how you're interacting emotionally and socially. And then think about how you're functioning in terms of your own very primal physicality. You know, are you having sex at all? If so, are you having it with the frequency that you want, not too much where you feel pressured to have sex a lot or too little where you feel sexually frustrated? Um, are you reasonably sexually satisfied in terms of what you want to do and what you have the opportunity to do? Is there some kind of a block where you're having trauma symptoms, like the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, because you've had a sexual trauma? Um, do you feel like there's a communication with a partner about either the living room issues or the bedroom issues or both? Because each partner in a couple needs to kind of hold the duality of the relationship. It's kind of like Jekyll and Hyde. You know, Hyde is the rough, you know, the id, the bedroom, the primal, the woof. Just a good old-fashioned, hot, sweaty, kinky, fun time. And the living room is more Dr. Jekyll, you know, the upstanding professional of the community and, uh, and all of that. And, you know, which corresponds with what Freud said, you know, was the ego and the superego versus the id, you know, the more primal drives. And we all have to balance within ourselves the more primal side and getting our needs met in that way versus the more evolved side, us the professional, us the guy in the community, us the son to our parents or brother to our siblings and things like that. And think a bit for a moment about which role needs more work for you. Maybe your sex life is great, but you know some of these living room issues are a shambles. Or maybe things are going pretty well in your life, but your sex life is underdeveloped and frustrated. So think about how you're balancing the living room and the bedroom sides to yourself within yourself. And then also think about how the, that might be going on with your partner. You know, would you say that your partner or spouse has more living room issues, struggles, or more bedroom issues, struggles from how you see him, you know, from the outside? And then, of course, you know, discussing how he would feel about those same things. Which role needs more attention to reduce the stress. So when we understand how the balance of the living room issues and the bedroom issues contribute to the atmosphere of our relationships, you know, under, usually under the same roof, sometimes under different roofs, but, you know, under the roof figuratively of the relationship with our partner or spouse, that kind of balance contributes to the long-term, satisfying, enduring, happy relationship that comes about as a discussion 
of these issues and really an awareness of them. So give that some thought and if you need help with these kinds of issues feel free to get in touch with me or one of my colleagues at Gay Therapy. Um, GayTherapyLA.com is the website. It's also Gay Therapy LA on Instagram. Would love to see you there. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please feel free to email me or text me. Texting is 310 area code in LA, 310-339-5778. So 310-339-5778 or just ken at gaytherapyla.com will also email me. And um, please like and comment and review the podcast if you like it, please. We need that kind of publicity just to kind of get the word out. Uh, followers on Instagram, followers on Facebook, Gay Therapy LA, um, all of that, and uh, would be happy to help and would be happy to respond to questions or comments as best I can, uh, depending on how many there are. And also, uh, if there's a lot of them on the same topic, I'll do like a podcast or a blog article or both on that topic, because I want to respond to the needs of the readers and the listeners like you. So thank you for that, and I will see you next time.